beginning in verse 14. This is on page 707 in your pew Bibles. Mark chapter 1, verse 14, page 707. I want to begin this morning by, by reading part of this text. So I want you to follow along with me. We're going to kind of break it down. We've got kind of a shorter passage of Scripture this morning, but I think it's just very, very powerful. Uh, I think this is our first view of what discipleship really is about. And so I want you to begin reading with me. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. I'm going to stop kind of mid-sentence here, uh, so bear with me. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, I want to stop right there. The time has come. It is a new era. It's a new time period. It's what you might call a paradigm shift. My microphone's going in and out, isn't it? Yeah. The light's on. And I'm home. Take off some of my other technology here. That's the problem. We've got too many technologies going around, so they must interfere with each other. Time is kind of the new time period. paradigm shift to things that are different now than they used to be. I had one of these in my house not too long ago. You see, always before, I had always said, Dory has to keep me around because... I'm the only one that knows how to turn on the TV and the sound system and everything. You know? So, I mean, if she gets rid, gets mad at me, gets rid of me and stuff, she can't ever watch TV. Because, you know, downstairs you have to turn on the TV, you have to turn on the uh, amplifier, the DVD player, and then you have to be able to run the Roku. And we don't get regular TV anymore. It just doesn't work at our house for some reason very, very much. And so we do everything through Roku. We watch Netflix and stuff. And so, you know, trying to get Dory to understand how to get everything turned on, number one, was a challenge. Number two, telling her how to find the show she wants to watch on the Roku on Netflix. I, I was like, man, I got this mate. She can't ever get rid of me. <laughs> and so, you know... I would be on a trip, I'd be down in Memphis, and the first night that I'd be gone, Dory would always call me and say, how do I turn the TV on? I want to work out, I want to watch TV. Well, one time I was even being nice to her, and so I took her iPad, and I made a, made a video. You know, I said, I said, hey, babe, it's me. Let me show you how to do this. And so I walked around, I showed her everything, but then she would call me and say, how do I find that video? <laughs> so, anyway, I love my technological challenge. Why? When we were on our men's retreat, First night we're there, she called me and she said, I want to work out. How do I find the video that tells me how to turn everything on? I said, well, while I'm here, I'll just tell you how to turn everything on. Life is great. She can't get rid of me. Then I come home from the men's retreat. And one day, I'm upstairs doing something. She said, I'm going to go downstairs and work out. So after she was down there for a little bit, I thought, I'm going to go down and turn everything on for her. And I walk downstairs, and it's all on. in trouble. <laughs> that, that's it the huge paradigm shift all of a sudden I am threatened you know if she can turn the TV on what does she need me for <laughs> whole brave new world I'm living in these days I have to watch after things I think Jesus is explaining to the people here guys it's a new time period it's a new world things are different and, and so he says the time has come and then he goes on and he says, the kingdom of God is near. That's what this new time is about. It's not about living the way we've always lived in the past because that time has gone. Now there's a new time. The kingdom of God is here. And then Jesus begins to explain the change that needs to take place. And he begins that with this word, repent. Now, the word repent... I, we've all heard definitions of it before, you know, to repent means you're walking this way and all of a sudden you stop and now you're walking this way. It means to leave the sinful life that you've had before. It means to, uh, to turn from the sin in your life. It means to 
be heartbroken before God and cry out that I am a sinner. And, and I think all those things are true, but I think it goes even deeper than that. Several years ago, <coughs> I was, most of you know I worked as a volunteer uh, kind of youth minister at the church in Everett, Washington. We had gone to a retreat over on Woodby Island one time. And uh, Mark, what's the name of the church that's over there? On oh, Woodby, do you remember? Okay. Any, anyway, uh, we had gone to a retreat over there, and I had like three girls. Uh, they were all sisters, and and uh, another lady went with us and watched after the girls, and then I took care of the guys. We had three guys. We had Brian, we had Eloy, and we had Matt. And me and, and Matt and Eloy and Brian, we just hung out that first day. We went to the first session. We just had a great time. Well, then they turned us loose to this place where there were a bunch of old concrete bunkers. The military had set up there on Woodby Island to protect, to keep ships from coming into Puget Sound. And, of course, it's all this mail now, but we, we climbed the hills there. We hung around. We ran through the old concrete bunkers and stuff. It just had a blast, and I thought, you know, the, I'm really bonding with these guys. They're growing in their faith, and, and they're really coming to, to know the Lord. And so I was really excited about it. Well, that night, uh, we had a session that was like at 7 o'clock, and the guys wanted to go out and do something, and I said, that's fine, but be back here at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, we're all in the assembly hall, and we're listening to the keynote speaker, but Brian and Matt and Eloy aren't there. And so I went looking for them, and I found them, and they were back in the concrete bunkers. And so I said, guys, get out of here. we gotta, we got to go. And I was pretty, pretty hot with them, pretty upset with them. I was really disappointed with them. And as we're walking back, Eloy came up to me and said, Lance, we were trying to leave, but, but Brian wouldn't, wouldn't let us leave. Brian is the one who kind of started this. And, and I suspected that because Brian could sometimes be Brian. <laughs> And so we get back, and I send Eloy and Matt in, and I said, you guys go on in. And I said, I said, Brian, come here, I want to talk to you. And so we went out there, and I said, hey, Brian, what's the deal? And he said, the deal is I don't need to be here. I said, what do you mean you don't need to be here? And he said, I just don't get this. And he said, we come to all these things, and they tell us how bad we are, and they tell us that we need to change, and all this stuff. And he said, and I'm a good kid. Now, I know you're thinking, yeah, he just misled the other guys in the group, but, but his whole argument was, you know, I've, I've never broken the law, I've never broken the Ten Commandments, I'm, I'm a good kid, I was raised in a good home, I've really never done anything bad, I don't know why I have to keep being drugged back here all the time to be told that I'm a sinful person and I need to do it. He said, I'm not. And that really kind of hit me. Because he just didn't really quite get what he needed to repent of. And I think sometimes we, in churches, because we see of repentance as so closely tied with evil sin that we need to turn from, I don't think we really get what repentance is truly, truly about. So I want to share with you some passages this morning that, that help us, I think, understand what repentance is about. And I hope, well, that's really what. Can you read that? Okay. Yo is what I heard. Combination between yes and no. First Kings chapter 8 says, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. I think that's very important that... that Kings begins this way, there's nobody that doesn't sin, okay? Which means everybody has a need for repentance in some way. For, for when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies, who take them captive in their own lands, far away or near, and if they have a change of heart. Now, I've italicized some words up there, and I've noticed this morning, I wish I would have bolded them. But there's some words in here that I think help us understand repentance. And it says, but if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly, and if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive, and pray to you, 
toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen, the temple I have built for your name. Then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, we have almost, almost the same passage. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll, I'll go down through there and look at some of the things that I've highlighted. <coughs> One of them is have a change of heart in the land where they're held captive. Repent, plead with you, saying we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul, then we get over here in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, uh, verse 24. In those days Hezekiah became ill and he was at the point of death and he prayed to the Lord uh, who answered him and gave him a sign, a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud and he did not respond to the kindness shown him and therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. And then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart. And as did the people of Jerusalem. In uh, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23. How long will you who love your simple ways. How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge. Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. And I will make known to you my teachings. Now notice that. This is just the difference of us loving our simple ways and not God's ways. Isaiah chapter 30. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. There, there's a parallelism there. Repentance and rest is parallel with quietness and trust. Rest meaning not always trying to make sure that everything happens the way that I want to happen, but resting. Trusting is not trying to make it all happen my way, but trusting that God's way is going to happen. And that God's way is right. And that's the quietness and trust. And then it's kind of an example. It says, you, will, you said, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one and the threat of five. You will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. What God is saying through Isaiah is, well, as long as you think you are in control, you need to repent. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, and again, I'm not going to read through all of this, but, but it talks about they felt no pain. They refused correction. Uh, they didn't know the way of the Lord or the requirements of their God. They turned away from their God and they worshipped other gods and other idols. He says they committed adultery. They thronged the house of prostitutes. Instead of relying on their husband, God, they committed adultery with other idols or things that they thought would provide for them. Jeremiah chapter 8, I have listened attentively, but they do not say what is right. None of them repent of their wickedness, saying, what have I done? Each pursues their own course, like a horse charging into battle. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. This is talking about, you know, sometimes there are just things that we don't know, things we don't understand. But when we grow up and we understand a little better, uh, it creates an understanding in our head that we now act differently. Exodus or Ezekiel chapter 14, Therefore say to the people of Israel, this is what the Lord says, Repent, turn from your idols and renounce your detestable practices. 
when any of the Israelites or any foreigners residing in Israel separate themselves from me and set up idols in their heart and put the wicked stumbling, put a wicked stumbling block before their faces, and then the, and then they go to a prophet to inquire of me. He says, these are people who, they go off, they do their own thing, they seek their own way in everything, but then when things get really bad, then now they'll come back and want something from God. Ezekiel chapter 18. Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all of your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. You see, it goes beyond just the actions. It's a heart issue. It's a spirit issue. A couple of others that I want us to look at. Uh, but I didn't write these up here on the board because I want to talk about them just a little bit more. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, which is what we're at today. I don't know why I put that one in there. But turn over to Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. On page 741 in your pew Bibles, Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. <coughs> There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and he lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. And the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was... Uh, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us there's a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to, to you cannot, nor anyone can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to him, or to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if you send someone from but if but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. Now, what's going on in this story is this man who is in this place of torment is saying, send somebody because my brothers don't understand Moses. They don't understand the prophet. They're not living the way that they're supposed to because they don't get it. But if somebody from the dead goes to them, they're going to get it, and then they will repent. And so it's an, it's an example of, a, of an understanding that wasn't there before. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, page 772, for those of you that need to turn there, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter has just preached the first sermon explaining to the Jews who Jesus is. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him Lord and Christ by raising him from the dead. And so the people said to him, well, what do we do? And his response, repent. You guys need to understand who this Jesus really is. And you need to understand it to a point, you don't need to understand that, that this is the one God raised from the dead. You need to understand it to a point that it changes who you are at your very core. In Acts chapter 3, verse 17, Now, brothers, I want you, I, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all of his prophets, that his Christ would suffer. 
Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the time of refreshing may come to you from the Lord. There was a time when you were ignorant. But you're not ignorant anymore. And the knowledge that you have now needs to change who you are. You need to repent from your ignorance. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them, any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter uh, and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this authority that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the, the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord and perhaps He will give you, uh, forgive you for having such thoughts in your heart. You see, Simon didn't understand. He was looking at everything from a worldly perspective. Man, if I can get this power where I just lay my hands on people and they get the Holy Spirit, can you imagine how much money I can make? Benny Hinn will have nothing on me, is what Simon was saying, or what he was thinking. And, and Peter said, you need to, you gotta, you gotta understand, that's not what this is about. Repent from this wicked worldly way of looking at things. Over in Acts chapter 17, we're getting close to the end of these passages. Bear with me. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 22. Paul then stood up at the meeting of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I understand he's speaking to people that don't even understand, they don't believe in God yet. He says, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and observed your objects of worship, I even found an altar to, with, an, with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown. I am going to proclaim, proclaim to you the God who made the world and everything that is in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation and men that they should inhabit the whole earth. He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of you, uh, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. You know, there was a time when God overlooked our ignorance and we didn't understand about him. We didn't know about him. But now he wants us to repent of that ignorance. He wants us to know and understand. The last one I want us to look at is in chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. Although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus so see, 
repentance really has to do with turning from sinful ways, turning to God. It has to do with, to re with returning to God with all your heart and with all your soul. It has to do with trusting in God. Trusting that He's really in charge and that He's going to make everything work out the way it needs to be and not trying to take charge ourselves, but trusting in Him has to do with knowing what pleases God and then doing those things has to do with realizing that God's kingdom is here and believing and following that. You didn't put an end panel on there for me. I apologize for that. But I had my conversation with Brian those years ago. And Brian was sitting there and he said, well, he said Lance, he said, I'm a good kid. I haven't really done anything wrong. Don't know why you guys are always beating me over the head telling me that I need to change and be a better kid. <coughs> And I thought I had all the right answers about everything until that moment. And I stood there for a bit. We actually had quite a bit of time to, to, to uh, stand there and talk because I had to call Brian's parents. He finally just told me, he said, I'm not going back in there. I want to go home, call my parents. Well, the ferry had made its last trip for the day, and so we had to wait like two hours till midnight till the parents showed up. They were real happy with me. <laughs> So we're standing there talking, and I thought about this for a while, and finally I asked him, I said, Hey, Brian, let me ask you a question. When you roll out of bed first thing in the morning, do you say, this day belongs to God? And I will give every moment, every thought to Him. Do you surrender every moment of your life, every act that you do, do you surrender that to God? And he said, no, that's none of us can do that. Well, that's what Kings says. None of us is without sin. But all of these other passages say, but that's what God wants. God doesn't want Lance in control of Lance's life. He doesn't want Mark in control of Mark's life or Jim in control of Jim's life. What God wants is God in control of Lance's life. Every thought I have needs to be captive to him. Every action I do needs to be for him. But I'm not that way. And that's why over and over again throughout Scripture, God writes to His people, the book of Revelation is filled with it, to, to Christians saying, repent, guys. Because you see, there's a new time here now. A new era that we have to live in. Jesus says, the time is near, the kingdom of heaven has come, so repent. First step in discipleship is repentance. Realizing that I'm not in charge. Second thing Jesus says is, first he says, back to Mark chapter 1, he says, repent, and then he goes on, he says, and believe the good news. Because you see, there's one thing to accept that and acknowledge that. You know, I know that in my home, in the new area, my wife can run the TV now. But now I have to believe that. Belief in the New Testament doesn't really have anything to do with, with getting it in our heads and, and say, oh yeah, I believe it. It has to do with a change in our hearts. You see, I'm going to have to clean my garage now. I didn't put that off. I didn't really have to worry about getting the garage cleaned out because she got to keep her out and turn the TV on. But now... My life has to change. And I'm joking about it. She's not going to get rid of me just because she's trying to be real. Sure. I don't clean the garage, she may consider it. But, <laughs> but the reality, Jesus is saying, guys, it's a new time. Not only do you need to understand it in your head, but it needs to change who you are. That's what belief is in the New Testament. To believe in God is to surrender our lives to Him. And so Jesus says, repent and believe. That the king believed the good news. Now, what is the good news? Well, what he just told him, the kingdom of heaven is here or near. And that's what you need to believe. 
And that knowledge ought to shape your very life. And so then we have this example of discipleship. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for there were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets, and they followed him. And when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and, the brother, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. And I think this is a perfect illustration of discipleship. First is seeing the unseen, understanding that the world is a different place out there now because the kingdom of heaven is near. And once we come to realize that, once we see what's really out there, now we believe it. Which means that it becomes who we are. And then we follow the one who has brought that in, which means that we leave everything else behind. We quit hanging on to the way I've always done it, the way I've always lived my life, the way I've always been in charge, the way I've always pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and now I say, you know what? No. Lance really isn't in charge. The kingdom of heaven is here. And so I surrender all of me, and I follow the one that brought the and guys, that's what <coughs> discipleship is about. It's not about showing up at church on Sundays. You know, if you're a good Christian, you show up every Sunday morning. If you're a better Christian, you show up Sunday night too. If you really think that, you come to Wednesday night Bible class as well. <coughs> Jesus says discipleship is about repenting, believing, and following. That's what we have to do. The problem that we always struggle with is not seeing how closely this new kingdom is here. We talked about this a little bit last week. We talked about it in our class on Wednesday night. You know, we get blinded and distracted by all the stuff in this world. Our jobs, the money that we bring in, can we pay the bills, can we do this? Am I going to have time for everything? And we let all of these things restrict what we're supposed to do when God says, I want you to repent of that. I want you to trust me fully. <coughs> and so this morning, I invite you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. To repent. Leave your old world, your old life, and step into this new kingdom that's here. Believe it in a way that changes who you are at the very core. And decide today to follow. To walk in the footsteps of the one who gave everything for you. The one who died that you might live. And so this morning, if, if you would like to make that step to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, to come into the kingdom of heaven, we're going to stand and sing a song. If you need to, to make this change, we're going to invite you to come forward. If you want to find out more about it, come down and talk to me. We'll set up a time where I can help you understand some things a little better. Uh, whatever need you may have, please come forward and share that with us while we start.